Now, it's that time of the rugby season where we see a lot of players departing the Irish provincial system. A lot of those players into their mid and late 30s, retiring after great and long careers. Other guys leaving because they haven't been able to get the chance or haven't been able to get offered a new contract. But for my next guest, it's probably a tougher one because at the age of just 25, Stephen Fitzgerald was forced to retire after a very lengthy battle with uh, knee injuries dating back to the start of 2020. But I'm delighted to say Stephen's joined us this afternoon to chat through things. Stephen, how are you? I know there was a, a, t- a tough couple of lines to have to intro you with. Uh, I imagine a very, very tough period for yourself. But look, you're smiling there now. I know talking to you in advance, you've kind of been dealing with it for the last couple of months. And is it something that you've you've started to accept now and has become normal for you? Yeah, uh, I suppose it actually kind of getting it out there and everything, it actually did make it a bit easier to accept the fact that everybody kind of knew. I suppose myself, I probably knew from, say, the end of February after I had my third surgery on my knee, I was just like, I suppose I kind of started to accept actually the thoughts that it was, was having that it was a possibility and um yeah, like then I had a few kind of cu- rough couple of weeks, I suppose, actually coming to terms with it and dealing with it. But I suppose since I actually just accepted it, yeah, it's made it a lot easier. So with that last surgery, was that was that a case of pretty soon after the surgery, they were able to tell what we were going in there to try and fix? We just weren't really able to repair. Um, well, I actually think like my knee still doesn't feel great at the moment now, but I do like the surge and everything is hopeful that says somewhere down the line, like I will be pain free and everything. But I suppose after the last surgery, more so from my own point of view, I was just, I suppose, trying to weigh up the, like, obviously I always wanted to be a professional rugby player and I tried to plan that as long as I could. But then I suppose after that third surgery, when I woke up, I was just like, oh, what's the cost that I'm kind of putting on my body and then I suppose my mental space as well um because it was a very hard time and then I suppose I probably knew I said two or three weeks after when I was because obviously after surgery you're pretty much lying down on a couch just thinking and then I suppose a couple of weeks after I just made the decision yeah so it wasn't a a case of I was was kind of going to ask that later on as well but is it something that slowly dawns on you over a period of time that this is something that's going to have to be done? Or I was wondering, was it a case of you're doing everything you can to get back and you go into the, you go into the surgeon to, to meet back up with him for a chat and he delivers the, the news to you that no, this is yeah. working. You're going to have to pack it in. It was, it was, it was the former those that you kind of realize it over. It was a period probably, of time. yeah, I'd say. So after I had my second surgery, I suppose the, like before that say the eight or nine months before that like obviously when I first done it the thought of oh if this doesn't work out great was probably in my head but I suppose once I got the surgery done and cracked on my rehab like the thought of retiring for say the first nine months wasn't in my thought process at all because everything was going well and everything's like I didn't really have any major hiccups but I suppose it was after I had that second surgery I did start to get thoughts more frequently and I remember at the time I'd like get so angry with myself for even thinking that way I was just almost like Jesus why are you being soft like thinking like this I was like and tried to get it out of my head but I remember I just get like really angry at stop thinking like that you know like it's just so negative like just like you'll be fine but I remember looking back at that time now I actually wish I probably accepted the thoughts at the time because it would have just made it a lot easier and everything whereas I was just getting so angry at myself for having the thoughts and then yeah I suppose sorry to answer your question that it was probably over um the few weeks so I had that surgery in November I think and then from November until January the thoughts were probably becoming more frequent the fact that I suppose it wasn't getting as good as I thought and then I remember once I just went out running, I think it was around January. It was actually the day we played Munster up in up in the sports ground. And I remember I just ran before it. And then I remember just on a few runs, I was just like, Jesus, like this just feels terrible. And it shouldn't have felt that bad. Like it was only 
like say gone fifty percent, and then the next day it was the worst my knee has felt in the eighteen months. Like I remember, I could barely even bend it; it was so swollen, so stiff. And then uh, yeah, I had to go in for the third one. I might I might go right back to the start to to get all yeah. of this like September twenty fifteen. Monster waste the Ospreys. You're 19 years old. You come mm-hmm. off the bench, make your debut, you score a try. Like, I imagine that's the day where you're absolutely on top of the world. You'd be 100% yeah. forgiven for thinking future Irish international, British and Irish lines probably in 2021, whatever, or down the line. Mm-hmm. Like, all these thoughts are probably going through your head. I'd love to just get an idea yeah. of what that feels like for a 19 year old to be. Coming on, I actually st- I actually started that first match. <laughs> you started it, all that, right. even better, <laughs> even better, even better. But like, yeah, what, what was what was yeah. that like? I suppose obviously, like, say I went into the academy and everything like that, and then I suppose the thoughts when I knew things were going well was probably actually the year before playing for the Ireland under twenties. Uh, thankfully, I had a successful enough time playing with them and scored a few tries, and then. Like, I wish looking back now that I didn't kind of believe all the hype that there was around me. But like, when you're a young fella, it's kind of hard not to. Like, I remember there was times when like I was I just be like flick, flicking through Instagram or Twitter or something, and I saw one. I don't know who it was had an article up about me being like, oh, like this is the next best thing since Keith Earls, and potentially could be better, and like. <laughs> I remember, like, at, like, growing up, like, Earls, he was, like, the man around Limerick, like, you know, and everybody wanted to be him. And I remember, I think I was 18 or 19 at the time, and I'm just like, geez, like, somebody's comparing me to Keith Earls, like, you know, and, like, I wish, I suppose, I didn't really believe that, but the scene, um, and then, yeah, I suppose when I made my debut, um yeah it was unbelievable like i'll never forget it like we obviously won the match i think uh keith's got a kick in the last play of the game to win it and then i remember like we all went out after and i remember being like jesus like this is the absolute life like you know i can't get any better than this like you know i just said scoring on my debut like getting texts and calls from literally anyone who would ever talk to me and yeah, I thought it was only going to go up and up after there until my next match. <laughs> what, what was what was the next one? Did you come crashing back down to earth on that? Yeah, yeah. So obviously I played all right in that match and then we were playing Scarlet away um, a few weeks later. And <laughs> looking back now, I still think that was one of the worst matches I've ever, <laughs> ever played. <laughs> I didn't play for a year after that for the senior team. <laughs> Would you have been, like you were saying there, you know, you you know, when you're 19, you kind of you're trying not mm. to believe the hype, but sometimes you might a little bit. Were were you a cocky little yeah. fella back then? Were you? Like I wasn't cocky at all. Well, sorry, I'd like to think I wasn't. I'm sure <laughs> there'll be a few people now who will say otherwise, but like I don't think I was. But as I was saying, like when you're a young fella and you see all this the stuff being read about you and like comments everywhere and like you hear chats of say like. I can't remember just coaches talking about me once in Munster and then yeah it's, just, it's hard not to kind of get sucked into it and I suppose that's what the best players do they just don't really either they don't believe it or they just black it out but as I was saying I, I don't think there'd be many of those people that at such a young age being able to do that because you come from like say playing for your school or your club or like you're only kind of known around, say, Limerick, if, mm. if you are even known or whatever. And then, as you say, you go on and you play a few good matches for the Ireland under twenties, and <laughs> you think you're, <laughs> you think you're the big man. Then, <laughs> who would have been, who would have been in your peer group then, in terms of schools rugby coming through the age system at Ireland, the nineteens, twenties, those kind of things. Um. Well, for Irish under twenties, we actually had like. I think we were looking back now. I think we finished eight in the World Cup, but like there's so many lads that have gone on to play professional rugby. Like I think the back line alone, we had Nick McCarthy, there was uh, Ross and Joey at 10. 
Then there was Sammy Arnold, 12, Gary, 13. Uh, I was one wing, but I didn't even start the first match. There was like Kieran Gaffney at the time. And then Jack Owens was on the other wing. And Jacob Sockdale started a few matches and he was on the bench for a few. He was a year out of his age. And then... I suppose came true. Yeah, that was a decent enough stock of players, particularly a solid yeah. backline. You'd have to say solid backline. I but... know, yeah. And then there was there was loads of forwards as well then who came through. So yeah. So like through that period, through the under twenties, and through the start when you're getting the the monster break around when you're nineteen or twenty mm. years old, so like that's all going great. And as you said, it probably stalled. Then it was another year or so before before you. Yeah played for Munster injuries was something that seemed to catch up on you around that time as well yeah you were kind of coming out of academy into the senior setup I remember I think so that was my first year in the academy and then if I'm not mistaken I think my second year I think was when Razzie and Jack came in and I remember I was kind of just like because obviously as I said I played those two matches say around September October and then didn't play for the rest of the year so I, I was obviously pretty down in the drums because I said that was the first kind of like, I suppose, low period I had since I went in there. Um, or was it even my third year that Razzie came in? I'm not sure anyway. Um, no, I think it was my second year. And then we had like, I remember that preseason, the first year they came in looking back was still the hardest thing I've ever done. Like it was so hard because I was still so young and like, I was a skinny little fella, like had barely any muscle on me or anything. But I remember some of the drills they used to do in that preseason were so hard. But like anyone else, like we worked really hard. Um, and then I didn't get picked for the first match for them, but I was on the bench against Cardiff. And at the time, well, I'd like to think that Razzie and Jack liked me because I said I was a young fella. I worked hard, and like I know Jack especially was doing a lot of work with me and helping me and stuff. And then the next week I wasn't playing again. And then I went out for Shannon and I actually tore my syndesmosis in my ankle and had to have an operation on that. And I remember if I didn't have that, I think I, like Zeebs was injured and then Andrew Conway got concussed. And like I was the say third choice full back before then. And I remember if I hadn't got injured, like I would have started something like the next six matches at full back. And because that's how long the two lads were out, obviously, if I played well or whatever. Um, but obviously, I missed out on that. Um, and I like at such a young age, if you would have got an opportunity like that, especially when a few of the internationals were away, like it just brings people on so much. Um, and I always think back to like my career as that being one of like the biggest opportunities I suppose that I missed out on so then I had surgery on my ankle and then unfortunately like my ankle was never really right and and then I suppose I just kind of learned to deal with it which is what you kind of do in rugby but ankle as well um so yeah and then like would injuries have been something like you know I would have played rugby in school and stuff and there were always lads a lot of the better players as well there were some mm-hmm. of them that just always had injury problems were you someone like that that was constantly picking up little bits like that or was it really until those big injuries arrived that it started yeah, like I, I actually never really like picked up say like hamstring strains or quad strains or anything like that like thankfully touch wood I've only had one concussion um so yeah it was only like it was only kind of the big one to say, like, when I first saw my syndesmosis, like, my ankle was just always at me, like, but as I said, I was able to kind of train and play with it, which is, as I said, what you kind of have to do, but I was lucky, and I suppose that I never really picked up too many small knocks. It was always, like, say, my ankle or, unfortunately, my knee in the last few years. Yeah, and then, so, by the end of 2020, the move to Connacht comes about mm. is that is that something you kind of sought out yourself were you ready to move on from Munster at that point or was it just an opportunity um, where where they needed bodies and they came calling and you just went with it yeah um I suppose it's probably the first I remember say the end of the year before in Munster I'd actually started to play a bit um 
I think I went on a tour to South Africa and then I played against Ulster and I started a few matches and like I was playing really well and I remember at the time being like I wish there was like four more months left in this season because I knew that Zeeves was miss- moving on and then I was finally starting to get a lot, lot of opportunities and then I was actually playing well. And I remember, like, when the season finished, I was just like, why is this happening? Like, you go through all the months where you don't play, and then you start playing, and then the season finishes. And, and, you're, then, and, so, you're, like, and you're fully fit, and you're, you're rare. Yeah, yeah, finally, like, starting to get my chance, not having many niggles, and then actually playing. And then I remember, like, Zeebs left, and then Mike Haley came in, and I suppose I thought I was going to get a lot of opportunities in the following season, um, and I'm Unfortunately, that just didn't materialise. And then, yeah, I remember, I think it was Tiernan, Heels, and I think Tiernan, Heels and Easy were all injured. And then I suppose Connor came and inquired about me. And yeah, at the time, I was definitely ready to move on. Like I would have, like when that opportunity came up, like I definitely wanted to leave. And was was your brother Connor at Connacht by that stage, was he? Yeah, it was funny. So like me and Connor were at Munster when he came into the academy and done a few years there and then he left and then Mossy Lawler and Tucky got on to him about going up to the academy in Connacht so he was up there and he was going well I think a few weeks before I went up like he made like his European debut against Sale and like he played really well in the senior squad already after playing with Munster and not getting any opportunities and then I was looking at Connor like playing in Europe and everything like that. Um, so then I followed him up the road to try and get some. <laughs> the Shannon Mafia looking after each other with Massey, <laughs> know, yeah. Massey and Colly Tucker as well. We all stick together. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, and like, it, it seemed to be going quite well for you in those early days. As mm-hmm. kind of, like, if you look from the end of 2020 when you arrived yeah. to the, the start of 2020 or 2018 to start of 2020 when the injury hit, like you had played... 18, 19 games, so regular enough yeah. game time and stuff like, like I that. I remember when I, went up, longer, right? uh, when I went up to Connacht and obviously I had gone from like saying, having not played a match for the senior team in three or four months and then I think I went up, I actually my first day up there was Christmas Eve and then I remember I played the first match that week against Ulster um, and then I think for the rest of the season, like the 10 matches that were left or whatever, I only wasn't picked in one of them. Um, and then I actually started the quarterfinal against Ulster that, um, like at the end of the year. So, yeah, it went really well. It was mad, I suppose, how quickly a change kind of happened where I felt like I was so far away from the starting team in Munster. And then I went up to Connacht and I started in a quarterfinal. What does that what does that do for your confidence then by the the end of that 2018-19 season where you've you've gone from not getting a sniff of any action mm. at the start of the season at one club to changing up and all of a sudden more or less week in week out you're out in the pitch oh, and you're like, playing all over again. It's, it's mad like what it does for your confidence like I remember in Monster, like literally being so low, like thinking that like I was nearly going to be playing every second game after a few matches the year before, and then like literally not getting a sniff. I remember like I literally like I was almost questioning myself, being like, Jesus, am I actually a good player? Like, or like am I actually able to play rugby? Like literally feeling like I'd no confidence whatsoever because I wasn't playing and I wasn't getting picked or whatever. And then yeah, I went up to Connacht and then was playing all the time. And to be fair, to Friendly and to Nige, they just installed so much confidence and belief in me that like, I was just able to go out and actually play how I wanted to and actually express myself. Connacht do have a reputation, like in probably in the last mm. 10 years or so, particularly for for picking up guys who haven't been getting it good at, across the other provinces and yeah. putting a bit of fire into them. Like you only have to exactly. look at someone like Tom Daly as well, who arrived at Connacht at pretty much the exact same time as you did. And it was funny. You know, me, and Tom actually, now this week. me and Tom were actually talking about that. I think it was last week before the Irish squad was announced. We were just chilling out in his house and we were just chatting. 
but like when me and him, I think he came the week before me and then I came and we were just saying how like two years ago when we came, like we were both probably like being like, oh, if we could just get a contract for next year, like, you know, we'd be happy. And then two years later, like Tom's in the Irish squad, like, you know, and hopefully it'll get a run out there. But it's mad how quickly things can change. Like, as I said, we were like, we'd only be delighted to have been able to stay playing professional rugby. And now he's in the squad. Yeah. Um. The the game where it all changed for you then the the injury January twenty twenty mm. against Leinster at the RDS. Um. My talk about the game itself first because as I've seen you mention in an interview, like it was it was a big occasion for you. Like yeah. you know, it was, I think you said it was your first time that you were properly picked over Tiernan O'Halloran at fullback. Yeah. Yeah. Like I remember obviously like. When I was watching could say Connacht win the Pro 14, like the back three were a massive part of that. And like Tiernan was unbelievable. Like he was playing such good rugby, such an attacking threat. And um, yeah, I think so like the year before I came up, he was on the Irish tour. I think if they went to one I'm not sure if it's South Africa or Japan, but I he was on that anyway. And then um I remember I came up and obviously Tiernan was the out and out full back up there. And I would like to think that I was a pretty ambitious fella and that I backed myself and everything like that. So I just set myself the goal of trying to get ahead of T um, as being the starting full back. And then I never, like, I played on the wing when he played full back. And I, but I'd never actually, like, say, started ahead of him or say, came off the bench for him. But I'd never got picked ahead of him. And then I remember the, Leinster match was the first time, yeah, that I'd ever picked it or got picked ahead of him. And then that's what I remember. I was just like, it's weird. Like, I was just so excited for that match. Like, because we were playing against Leinster in a Christmas intro up in the RDS, like the pitch's class out there. And I remember just being like, just don't let this like opportunity kind of pass you by. Like, just go out and enjoy it. Like, this is what you set yourself this goal of for like a year and a half and you finally achieved it. Now we just, go out and enjoy it like express yourself and <laughs> little did I know that would be the ending of my career <laughs> yeah look it's it's awful the the injury itself then yeah. did do, do like is it all a bit of a blur do you remember do you remember no, exactly remember what happened it, I remember it and uh like I think Luke McGrath just kicked the ball and he actually kicked it a bit long so I kind of caught it pretty easily and then I remember I was running back and Initially, I was running down towards like uh, forward and a back, but then I actually saw like to the left of me, there was kind of like two forwards. So like when you're a back three player and like you're counter-attacking, like that's an opportunity. And to kind of take them on. And then I remember I just stepped off my right foot and like no contact whatsoever. I just stepped. And then I remember it was like... The thing they always say, it was almost like my studs done like too good of a job that they like planted in the ground too good. Because when I tried to turn off then, like my knee just like buckled in and like I felt loads of cracks and pops, but like it wasn't anything bad or anything like that. I remember initially for say the first 20 or 30 seconds just being really, really uncomfortable. But I felt like I could have played on, like I walked off the pitch and everything. And um, yeah, like the funny thing about that was that Connor actually got injured in that match as well. And like he hurt his ankle, but he only like hurt a bit of like scar tissue, which like, is nothing. But he got stretched off the pitch and had to get a green whistle and everything. And he was available to play next week. And I walked off the pitch then and my career was over. Oh, jeez. <laughs> God almighty. Tough it up, I think. Yeah. Um, the, I... I imagine there's a bit of a wait, obviously, while you're waiting to get back scan mm. results to tell you exactly, you know, this is this is an ACL injury. What's yeah. that, what's that wait like? It was weird because like um, I went in and uh, there was two physios on Gary Cochran and Emma, and Emma was the one who actually brought me into the dressing room to look after me, and she like put me in the brace and was like doing all the tests and. She was doing the tests and um, like I'd be the type of person that I just want to know straight away, like, you know, what's the story? Uh, 
and she was just like oh she was like we'll have to wait and get the scans and I was like look Emma I was just like in your opinion like you know what it is and she's just like I'd be really worried about the ACL and then I remember I was just like oh it's like it's weird you hear of all these people getting like these massive injuries like that and like they're out for so long but like I just never thought I'd get like something massive like that you know you just never feel like it's going to happen to you and then I remember when she told me that I was just like oh my god like I was just like how have I torn my ACL I was like how has this happened to me so then I kind of knew I suppose I kind of had in my head that I was just like oh okay like it's the ACL on the Monday or the Tuesday I think it was the Monday and then I got the results that evening and uh, Chopper, Dave Hanley, he actually rang me and told me. And then I suppose when you actually get told the news that it actually is your ACL, it's way harder than actually known. Because obviously I was like, oh, yeah, it's the ACL. But I suppose you still always have that 1% where you're just like, oh, hopefully it was just something else. Um, but yeah, it was probably one of the hardest things that I've ever had to hear when they told me it was the ACL. Yeah, I can imagine so. In terms of the rehab, I know you said at the start that mm. like once you kind of got into the rehab and you're into the day to day process of it, you're generally upbeat because, you know, you're, you're yeah. thinking positively like, you know, OK, this is the benchmark. I'm going to gonna try to get back by this yeah. point in time and stuff. How how close did you did you ever re- come to actually making it back? Do you think how close did you did you yeah, get to, actually came, to it being OK? I came really I came really close, which was a really frustrating thing. Like, I actually got back team training around the end of October for two weeks. And, like, I was going really well. Like, I was training really well. I actually remember, I think, Friendly and Nige actually asked, could I play a match one weekend once? Because, like, I looked, like, normal, like, is the best way that I can describe it. Like, I didn't, like, I was stepping off my knee, like, everything felt fine don't get me wrong now I was absolutely blown out my hole I was I felt so unfit when I actually got out <laughs> training um but yeah because like and again I, I kind of hate saying this but like the lockdown kind of came at the perfect time for me because when you're injured like it's actually really hard to be in and around say the training center where everybody trains because you're just so far away from the lads and like whenever they have a big win or anything like that happens don't get me wrong you're delighted for them but it just makes you feel so much away from them because you're just not involved in it at all yeah you're you're part of the team and, but you're not it, but you're not yeah because yeah, yeah. like there'd be weeks where i could go without say seeing someone or chatting to someone and then when you do come in every day someone's like oh how's the knee how's it going and don't get me wrong it's really nice of people to ask but it's just another thing that kind of reminds you oh yeah i'm injured and then, so I remember that the lockdown actually happened and I came down here to Kilkee with my girlfriend and like I was able to take all the equipment that I needed from Connacht and because she's actually a sprinter as well. So like we were training together and like I loved being down here because I actually say I ended up training way harder here than I would have in Connacht because like when I was down here, I was just like, all right, I just have one focus, like just get my knee raised. And I kind of trained on my own schedule and then yeah like when I was down here it was going really well and yeah and then obviously as I said I got back training and then for months I've been like oh, okay I want to be back for wrestling away or wrestling at home like I didn't want to set myself a goal like that because the one thing that people always said was that there is going to be hiccups there is going to be stumbling blocks and you don't want to get deflated every time you get pushed out a week and another week and like I didn't have any of them like obviously there was days where like they're like okay we're not going to run today we're going to run tomorrow because um the knee is just a bit stiff but they're like as I said I never luckily had like hamstring strain or a quad pull and then I got back training and then I actually set myself, I think my birthday is around November 13th. So I actually set myself the target of being back for that week. And there was a match on. I was like, geez, that'd be pretty cool now to get back from uh, injury on the week of your birthday. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And what was what was the setback at that point? 
it was really weird so they said i was back training like say sorry integrated now into training and then i think i done one full week so say i was integrating for like two or three weeks so say do one session with the team then do two sessions then do a full week and then it was my first full week and i done it and like went absolutely perfect like i was doing like say extra conditioning top-ups after the session to just keep a track on that and like it was going really well and then it was literally like I just came in one day and we were warming up and I was just like, this just feels a bit weird. Like it just doesn't feel the way I felt said a few weeks ago. And then I remember we were kind of doing this like tackling drill. And then obviously like when you're tackling, you kind of have to squat down and like, I think I was tackling Sam Arnold. Sorry. He didn't do anything wrong now <laughs> just so that he doesn't get to blame or anything. But he like I had to like he went to my right side so my right knee and I kind of had to like squat down on that and then I remember I was just like Jesus this feels so bad like it feels horrific and then I just pulled up and then I went and got a scan and then yeah I took him for the second surgery what's that like to deal with kind of rehabbing an injury and I suppose further down the line, re- rehabbing it constantly and and knowing it's not really right. Yeah, um, it was probably the end of the, like the midway through after that second surgery where it like really hit me hard. And when I got told I had to have the second surgery, like it, it really hit me hard because, as I said, I was so positive for the first nine months because like. I just knew what I had to do, like, you know, and I knew that I was like, okay, like, the, the, my knee is really good. Like, that's the annoying thing whenever I think back, like, my ACL has been perfect. Like, I haven't had one problem, like, with the ACL repair or they get it from your patella graph. Like, normally loads of lads have problems with their patella after they take the graph. How much frustrates me that I'm just like, that's the thing that was being fixed, yet that's been perfect um but then yeah like I suppose after the second surgery so I basically just had like a clean out done there because they didn't want because I had this thing over with cartilage but they didn't want to do that because that if I got that done it would have been like a seven month return so I was just like oh I'd like to go and do the clean out and see if that works um and then yeah I was rehabbing dad and then that was still even kind of going fine like we thought it was all healed up like it was still a bit sore and a bit painful but we were just kind of hoping that went away and then like done all the running drills all the speed drills to kind of prep you for runs and then that even went okay and then I actually done two runs excuse me and um they went perfect but then there was just one day where I was just doing a small bit of volume and then as I said I could feel that my knee just felt horrendous doing that and is that is that the day it really kind of hits that all right yeah. this isn't this isn't working yeah now? yeah I remember was it? it was after they had, the lads had another big win and I was so I actually live with say Paul Boyle and Connor and I think I knew my knee was was bad then like that that was uh, when I was a few weeks after and I uh, no, a week or two after that monster match I was talking about and I knew my knee was really bad but Connor and Boiler both went out and played and as I said I was living with them and like they both played really well and like they came home and like they were obviously buzzing and I remember being like oh my god I was just like I, f- I feel like I'm never going to experience that again and then I just remember obviously I was delighted for them but from a personal point of view I remember being like Jesus this is the hardest thing ever now being in the room with them because I just feel like I'm not going to experience this ever again when when the decision did arrive what was yeah. what was that like putting it in writing uh, it was, putting it putting it firmly firmly down in concrete this is it no going back it was back. really hard like it was so hard um, to be honest I don't think I would have been able to get through it obviously with my family but especially my girlfriend like there was a lot of days now where like <laughs> I was just being a bit of a prick <laughs> I don't know <laughs> that's not to say now in, uh, in this live but like because I'd just be like 
it would just be so hard for me like trying to actually make the decision and then like she just I suppose just be there for me and obviously she's the person I'm probably the closest with too so like obviously like there's times where I was just taking my frustrations out like and just I suppose giving out about everything I remember at the time I almost felt like by retiring that I was taking the easy option and obviously I know looking back now I'm not and like I felt like I was I suppose letting everybody down actually retiring because I know my parents and everything get so much from us playing and like playing well and I just remember yeah just at the time it was so hard to actually accept it like it probably took me the bones of two months to actually accept it like I'd wake up in the middle of the evening say for like four weeks I was waking up in the middle of the evening like thinking what am I doing or being like oh, okay I'm going to retire then I'd wait wake up the next day and be like what am I doing retiring like how am I giving up and then I changed my mind again and it was literally back and forth like that for ages and then yeah I suppose then as I said after the third surgery I was just like I just can't do this anymore and then I suppose it was when I actually started to do a bit of rehab on my knee and saw that it unfortunately wasn't that great that like looking back in it now, it was an easy decision to make because of the damage I was doing and everything. But I just, like I'll still always regret it and like have massive regrets about it. Yeah, absolutely, and totally mm. understandable as well. It, like as you say, there it was February when the third operation happened, and it was the end of the end of May, pretty much when you publicly announced it. Yeah, what was what was that? time like before before everyone knew about it like I presume you told, knew, you told the um, close friends and family and the team obviously yeah so obviously as I said I told all my close friends family girlfriend or whatever um like I remember it was literally I was just as I said I was just sitting down one day at home and then I was like I think I was with my girlfriend and I was like oh I think I'm gonna retire and she was just like what she was just like no you don't and like it was my girlfriend and my dad who actually found it the hardest, like, because obviously they know how much rugby means to me and everything, and they'd keep being like, oh, I just don't think you're done. Like, I just don't think this is the end. I just don't think it can end this way. And, like, I remember one day I literally had to be like the boy and, like, almost give out to them and be like, look, like, I've came to terms with it. Like, I'm not happy about it, but I'm okay with it. Like, you know, and I was just like, please I was just like can you just accept it for me I was just like because it's actually really hard like you know say talking to you about it sometimes because they just wanted what was best for me and I completely yeah. like understand it now I completely get where they were coming from like they just wanted me to keep living my dream and to say fulfill all the goals that I had and so yeah and then obviously we had that conversation and I think they accepted it then but yeah, it was really hard. Like, that was probably the hardest time, as I said, making the decision. Because, as I said, I told a lot of the my really close friends and then family, girlfriend, her family. And then, obviously, I started to tell a few of the Connacht lads and then, say, they might have heard off one or two people. And then I literally, I, I just announced it to their whole squad one meeting because I just had to... I was just like, I just want everybody to know because there was about a two week period there between me having made a decision. And when I told the whole squad that say like, I'd go in, have two or three conversations with people and being like, oh, I heard like the bad news or whatever. And then I was having like three of those conversations a day and it was like so hard because like I was still, I hadn't accepted it at the time. So I was still finding it so hard to deal with. And then, having all the conversations on top of it were so hard because I was almost trying to forget about it while coming to terms with it, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Was there was there a bit of a, a release in you kind of once you actually made it public and yeah. everyone knew and you didn't have to stop carrying around this little secret that, look, it's out 100%. there. And, and uh, like releasing like, a pressure valve. Like, in a, I keep on saying, like, in a selfish way, like, I was so happy when it did get released because everybody knew now, like, nobody was, like, say, as I was saying, I felt like whenever I met, say, like, 
some of my friends from Limerick or say family friends that like they either would say it to me and that would like make me have another long conversation about it and then it would kind of get me a bit upset or whatever or I could tell that they wanted to ask me how my knee was but they were almost afraid to because they didn't want to upset me or whatever so that was when it actually got out and like everybody actually knew like that thing I was getting loads of texts being like oh I hope you're okay I hope you're going like things aren't too bad but like when it actually got released in May like I was like (laughs) <laughs> me and my brother always say like we were just so done with the actual retirement because like we had dealt with it for like say the three months before and had the tears and like the long chats and everything that like by the time it actually came out in May we were just like happy that that I almost feel like that was the moving on point to everybody known how did how, how did Connor take it when he would have heard the news because I imagine now like he's in a position where I'd say he's probably not going to take anything for granted now, having seen what, you know, his older brother has gone through yeah. over the last couple of years. That, And I imagine you're certainly not going to let him slack off anytime soon. If you see yeah. him not putting in too much of an effort or something like that with training, remind him of what he has. You yeah. Know? Um, I know it kind of was great to be fair to him. I remember there was one day when I said around the second operation, when I was having the talks or whatever, and, I was just at home and like he literally just came in and asked me a question and then I just got really upset and like just had a few tears and I was Ireland so Connor went out to the kitchen and both of our girlfriends were out there and then they both started like having a few tears with Connor so like I was in the other sitting room bawling my eyes out because that was probably the first day where I actually accepted it because I actually went and had like a uh, really long conversation with friendly about it and then I came home and then as I said I probably just I suppose let out what I was probably battling up for the last few weeks and months and then it was hilarious because I just set off this chain of making everybody cry and everything like that um, but yeah that's the one thing that like my advice to anyone and I actually tried to say it to Tom Daly and Paul Boyd last week when they both got picked for Ireland I was just like please just like enjoy this day like that's my one regret that like I just didn't enjoy the good days more and I I really wish I did like say the big wins or like even anything like getting a contract extension or anything like that like I really wish that I just enjoyed them a lot more so that's the one thing that I'll definitely try and make Connor do from now on is just enjoy those times as much as he can. Yeah, it's a nice, nice, nice way to to sign things off. Before I leave you go, Stephen, yeah. uh, any idea what the what the future holds for you? No, uh, I don't really have a clue at the moment. Thankfully, as I said, um, I have Rugby Players Ireland and Deirdre Lyons with them is really helping me, and she's doing a lot of work with me and nearly having a few co- phone calls with her weekly. And she's been amazing with just trying to figure out. Thankfully, I finished off my undergrad in college so I what was that a in? business degree so uh, business and I majored in accounting and finance so if anybody out there wants to give me a hand at that <laughs> I wouldn't say no um, but yeah that was the one thing I said I didn't want to like rush into any job or doing anything like that because sorry the one thing that anyone who's retired has always told me is like just take a few months because you don't want, you just want time to just like relax and thankfully I don't have a family or anything like that so I'm in a position where I'm able to do that I'm not under like money scrutiny or anything so yeah I'll take a few months and then as I said Deirdre's working close to me and I'm very grateful for that so hopefully say around September time I might venture into the big bad world. (laughs) Well Stephen it's been a pleasure speaking to you and obviously it would be better if it was a, if it was under better circumstances, but the very best of luck for, for everything in the future. And thanks for joining us. Thanks a million. I appreciate it, Neil. Cheers.